What's up, everyone? This is Freedom of Fantasy from Holistic Songwriting. Welcome to the Holistic Songwriting Podcast. I'm here today with Adam Butler, the founder and CEO of Breathe Audio. Welcome, Adam. Thanks. How about we start a little bit with uh, what it is that you do? Which yeah, let's see if we can work that out together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so as you said, I have a company called Breathe Audio based in the Netherlands. Um, and we research the neurological effects of music. Uh, and we also write music uh, based off of that research. So you're basically looking at how music affects the brain and how you can use that to write better songs. Exactly. So we, you know, we know that music can make people happy or sad or excited or nervous, um, especially in combination with film um, or with a game or those sort of things. Because you are, you write music for video games and film exactly, mostly, yes. or do you also write music that is independent of a uh, picture? I do. I write, uh, I write my own music as well. Um, but my, my main priority, my, my training, my education was as, as a composer for film and TV. So it's mostly classical music or are you also interested in electronic music? I, I'm very interested in electronic music. Um, in my own, uh, in my personal life, I, Spent a lot of time in jazz bands, uh, in blues bands, uh, and rock, um, like every angry teenager. But uh, I love the combination of multiple uh, genres, multiple disciplines, be that classical with synth, as you see Hans Zimmer doing, for example, or, or the combination of rock and classical is also, uh, it's also very interesting. Yeah. And you said um, you look at how music affects brains of listeners basically right and how do you do that do you send people into mris or do you actually measure their brain con activity or what yeah so uh, so a typical experiment for us is quite simply uh putting an eeg headset on uh which tracks brain activity uh putting some headphones on uh listening to some music and watching uh what happens in the brain collecting that data across multiple patients. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm not familiar. What's an EEG headset? Is that like, is that like an MRI? But yes, it's, 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 uh, it's very similar, um, but it strictly looks at the activity within the brain. As opposed to an MRI, which? Uh, looks also at the biology of the brain. Aha, uh -huh, okay. So we're, we're very much interested in, in the activity. So what's happening? We're not looking so much at the tissue of the brain, but the sparks, the connections that are happening. And how can we stimulate that with music? That's that's uh, really what we're interested in. Cool. I mean, yeah. that's what the listeners probably are interested in as well. I hope and, so. And uh, <laughs> can you uh, already give us a little bit of an insight into what you've figured out so far? Yeah, so um, we found uh, actually there's uh, multiple things that can be done uh, with music. One of the most uh, impressive things about music is uh, unlike anything else that we know of, it's processed in multiple parts of the brain at the one time. So, As opposed to what people originally used to think, that it was a completely right brain kind of activity, right? Exactly. So if you see something, for example, that triggers one specific part of the brain. Or if you have a memory, for example, the hippocampus is a part of the brain that's almost completely um, responsible uh, for memory. Whereas music, it triggers multiple parts of the brain at one time. And that's because of the combinations of musical elements, uh, such as rhythm and harmony and melody and uh, density within the music, that sort of thing. Just a quick interjection sure. here. Is there Western music especially good at that, or are other cultures doing pretty much the same thing as well? I think it's it's not so, not so strictly um, driven by cultural music uh, or... Because I'm asking music. because I know, for example, African music doesn't have very much harmony, for mm -hmm. example. Like we are really, like the Western music has harmony, it has groove from, from African music originally. And it has melody, so it, that's why I'm asking. Well, it, it, it very much depends on what we're trying to achieve. So for example, harmony is not, might not necessarily be as important for a stimulation of adrenaline. But uh, in stress reduction, is is quite important in comparison to dissonance for example uh, too much dissonance could uh, induce more stress and harmony yeah it's in the name mm -hmm. uh, it brings harmony to the to the listener interesting interesting because i'm uh so what do you say about the trend of pop music becoming more and more just the same four chords being repeated over and over again do you do you find there's a correlation there maybe yeah absolutely um i mean it's uh what i like to call status quo syndrome People have found four chords that work for them, and uh, 
they keep going with that, you know. But that, that's been happening for as long as uh, we've been writing music. You only have to look at Pachelbel's Canon, for example. Mm. Which but, is a bit more than four chords, but yeah, still, yeah. Yeah. just a few more. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when you uh, when you break it down, the the chordal structure is it's just a framework, and it's what you how you embellish that, how you build on top of that that can uh, that can really make the music interesting. What I would also say is we have uh, this thing called the familiarity factor, which is if you hear a piece of music that would typically stimulate the brain in a certain way. If you've already heard that song before, or it's a song that you know, um, it could have a different effect. Mm -hmm. This is interesting because um, just today I read a, re a summary of um, the book that you said when we first met was a big influence on you. This is your brain on music by right. what's his name again? Uh, Daniel J. Levinson. Right, and um, I, this this line kind of stuck out from for me for, uh, from that re from that summary, and uh, it says whether or not you like a song or not. Is based on your expectations and ability to predict what's next. So that I think kind of ties in maybe with the chords, like the predictability of a song. But also, yeah, I'd love to hear your 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 point on. Like, point my, on so my opinion on this is again, it creates a framework or it creates a platform. And and uh, what Daniel says in his book um, is is quite an interesting point. My my personal opinion on this is that the framework, the platform gives us a playground to, um, to experiment in. So there's, there's this idea of, do we simply offer the listener what they expect in the framework that they expect? Um, so if we look at Pachelbel's Canon, we know the chordal structure, we expect a specific type of melody. But if we were to change that completely, what effect would that, that decision have on the listener as well? And it's that experimentation that I find quite interesting. To be clear, these changes that we're talking about here, is that a second-to-second -second kind of change? So is that like going from one chord to another or from one sound to another? Or is that, can you see that in terms of like a whole song going from maybe a verse to a chorus? Like how long are we talking in terms of perception of one particular sound or one particular element of a song? Well, I think it's uh, um, how long is a piece of string, you know? Um, you can you can see effects in in minor changes, but it will it could be small changes uh, and small results. Sorry, um, but if you can manage to maintain the effect across the the length of a three and a half minute song, mm -hmm. um, then it could amplify it. But at the same time, it could diminish it uh, because the brain becomes used to yeah. uh, the same trick. So comforting, for example, if you can comfort someone for three and a half minutes that's going to be more effective than comforting someone for three seconds. But if we're trying to surprise and energize, we don't want them to become too acclimatized to what's in there. And that's where the, you know, the, the uh, complex rhythms uh, might come into, into play. I think that makes sense as well if you look at um, classical structure, sonata form, because uh, it typically starts off with like the exposition kind of where we show you the theme, where we show you the motif, and then mm -hmm. later on that gets developed and we get to see more complicated sides of that same motif where it's reused, revamped, sort of remixed, if you will, right. to make it sound more complex. Once we've already gotten used to the simpler version of it, then the more difficult version seems like it's just the next logical step and it's slowly amping up the difficulty of the piece. Right. This is what uh, my, my problem with pop music is at the moment, is structural. Um, this framework that we talk about uh, is always the same uh, framework, and we, we see that in your book as well. The reason that you've been able to, to map out uh, the, the peaks and the, and the drops for hype, other variables within the music, is because we expect the music to be written in a verse chorus structure. Yeah. And we know that the, the chorus will bring more hype and the verse will have less hype. And the only really variation in there is um is the bridge. You know, that's that's the moment to shine, the moment to Well you play get around to be an artist. Yeah. Exactly. But what if we uh what if we took a completely different structure? What if we were to publish music into the top forty with a completely different structure that didn't have a verse and a chorus? First of all, I think it's safe to say it wouldn't make it into the top 40 because it's not commercial, quote-unquote commercial, and it's not what society expects from a pop song. But the question is then, um, are we restricting what pop music could be by formatting it to this one structure of verse chorus? I think that's a valid question. It's it's hard to say. I mean, um, I always looked at it 
in a way where where I th I think about the, the charts really as a place where it's just like the most popular thing, you know. And uh, I read this really funny quote uh, the other day: is um, if you ask, if you have a test group of a hundred people and you ask them what is your what's the best flavor of ice cream, you're always gonna get the answer: it's vanilla. You know, if you look at specifically at those people, a lot of them might not like vanilla at all. But just if you look at the average of all these people. A lot of people just like, you know, the, the normal, the boring stuff, kind of like that. That's what everyone kind of knows. Right. So that's kind of how I've always seen, seen the charts. Not that every song in the charts is boring or just super vanilla. I think quite the contrary is actually happening right now. I think we have a lot of very niche kind of style songs in the charts as well. Like thinking of songs like Work by Rihanna, I think is a very um, unusual song. Like it's a, or even look at what, look what you made me do by Taylor Swift is a very, unusual kind of song in the way that it's written so not necessarily what we come to expect from a pop song with like these big hyper choruses or something like that and uh with the mumbling of of work um but i think there is some truth to it that like i mean the 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 charts kind of give us sort of an average of what people like i think right and i think this is work is a great example because it maybe it doesn't completely break the structure but it definitely blurs the lines a little bit, and it does that with multiple multiple tricks. And I think that's one way that you can you can sound more original. And um, when we you know when we consider ourselves as artists in the general term, our our aim is to tell a story that's personal to us that maybe hasn't been told from our perspective before. Um, and I think that authenticity um, is something that's uh, really important uh, in in modern music. Maybe I go a little bit off topic, yeah. but I think it's a <laughs> it's a, a really fascinating subject. It, it is, and it's a, a sort of sociological phenomenon at the moment um, where we we seem to be promoting originality, but everyone is trying to be original in the same way, mm. um, which creates this paradox of if if everyone's trying to do the same thing to be original then actually no one's being original at yeah. all. And I think breaking that mold um, is something that creates authenticity, that creates a genuine originality. Artistry, yeah. Yeah. And I think you see that with people like Rihanna or Sia, for example. She's really great at yeah. breaking that mold. Or um, Ed Sheeran, in a different way, he's doing the um, uber normal and completely breaking he's out. He's noticeably of normal. He's noticeably different from everyone else that's exactly. on the charts. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, he just loves uh, hanging out with his friends and eating fried chicken and going to the yeah. pub and, you know, those I sort just, of things. I, for some reason, I stumbled on this video on YouTube where he just shoves, I think, 40 marshmallows into his mouth. Right. Yeah. Stuff like that. But when he was like a 13 year old kid or something like that. Exactly. And yeah. that's that's the sort of guy that you think, OK, that's that's someone I'd go down to the pub with. Yeah. <laughs> And which which is an image that a lot of other artists are trying to avoid. They don't want to have that sense of like this is a normal person. They want to have you have that sense of this is elevated exactly. um, personality that you could never reach. Kind of it's it's this idea of relatability versus uh, glorifying. Yeah. Um, does an artist want to be glorified and accepted as a, a higher uh, creative power, if you will, or do they want to be accepted by their peers? Um, that's why I really appreciate about artists such as Ed Sheeran is that authenticity. It takes us back to um, the roots in uh, in our culture, um, in our society. If you go back to to the folk um, music of um, of Ireland or of England and that sort of thing, um, musicians weren't put on a pedestal. They were part of society, and their role in society was to document and to tell the stories in a way that could, that could be remembered if you pass look at, on knowledge even yeah exactly and if you look at um uh sort of irish folk music the reason that the the music was actually written um was to help remember the stories mm. um so if someone felt that a story was was important uh, molly malone for example it's it's a story that they felt should be told and should be held within their culture and that's where the song came from. And that's where the poetry comes from. Yeah. And um, I think this nicely leads us into memorability and what it is that we remember about songs. And maybe have you figured out anything about how songs can make us memorize certain like bits? Like how, how can we make a chorus more memorable? Is there anything that you found out about that maybe? I think it's, it's difficult. It really is. There's so many different moving parts. 
to consider. There is, and um, it's it's always this fine balance. Um, so I'm, I haven't researched into um, how can we make something memorable. But um, what I can say about it is it's, it's not, I, d- I, I don't think or I can't imagine that it's one formula to make uh, something memorable. Because it could be memorable because uh, it's, a, it's a tune that annoys you. For example, the Benny Hill uh, theme isn't memorable because it's an amazing melody mm. that, uh, that warms your heart. It's because it's comical and it's somewhat annoying. Mm-hmm. Now, if you, um, if you think about the introduction from uh, Circle of Life from The Lion King, that's memorable because of the emotion it triggers in such a short amount of time. Um, when Lebowem drops in with the, uh, with the tribal singing mm-hmm. um, right at the beginning, you can just feel uh, the movie starting and you can see the sun rising over the, over the land and you get that feeling. So I don't think there's one way to make something memorable. It's also a definition, I think, of the word memorable, like because that's a memorable moment for sure. Yeah. But I'm I'm not sure if I could like replicate that melody right now for you because I don't think I mean I would remember the words or something like that. Right. Whereas there's a lot of songs from the charts right now that I could probably sing for you because I just know the words and I just they those kind of stick and even from songs that have come out years ago I yeah. could probably still sing right now you know. Yeah. And I think that's um, that's a transition between uh, a long term and a short term memory. I can sing songs that are in the charts now, but if you ask me in, in three years to sing those same songs, I'd probably have some trouble with it. Whereas if I listen to some music from the 80s, you know, there's certain Hall and Oates songs, for example, that I haven't heard for, for five, six, seven years, but I can still sing them from memory. Or yeah. Queen or uh, Guns N' Roses, for example. But also because we were exposed to those songs a lot more, I think, back then. I mean, I remember back when I was you know, a teenager, I had listened to a song maybe upwards of 20 times definitely right you know today i hear a song maybe 10 times but like a lot less you know exactly and that's that's the question as well um do we write a song that you want to listen to more and then the repetition makes it memorable or are we writing a melody in and trying to make the melody itself memorable mm. where does that um where does that recall, the recall memory, is is the part of the memory that makes you remember something. So a memory is held in the brain, and um, actually everything that we absorb, uh, everything we hear, everything we see is stored in our brain. But the processing of it to be able to bring that forward is called the recall. And your recall memory, how do we, how do we make, um, how are we able to recall a specific memory? How, how can we make that one thing stand out? Now, I, I, I personally think that if you make something original enough, it makes someone listen to it enough to store it deep into the memory. But the originality will be the, will be the element that helps us recall it. I, I think I briefly read in that summary of that, you know, this is our, this is our brain, our music, that uh, when you hear a song, it really leaves a kind of imprint on your brain, like, you know, these... You know these like sort of like these picture frames with all the the pins sticking out that you like put your hand on and then you know the pins come out the other side that sort of leaves like a hand. Right. And the last time we talked, you talked about this some more about helping people with, for example, Alzheimer's to um, you know sort of get back on track by listening to music that they listened to in their childhood. Or so this is this is um, one of the the researches that we're really trying to push forward at the moment. And it kind of, it kind of links into what we've what we've just been talking about about the memory, the recall memory. So there's a lot of debate at the moment about um, autos- uh, sorry Alzheimer's and um, and the question really is um, can music actually help someone with Alzheimer's on a neurological level, or is it just um, the recall um, that um, that is 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 happening that that they hear a, a, a piece of music from their childhood or from their youth. Um, and because they've heard that song so many times, uh, it's almost branded into their brain. What we're trying to do is actually um, slow down the offset of Alzheimer's. So we're trying to use music to keep the brain more active, to, to uh, help the brain generate more brain cells in an attempt to... Um, 
to prevent Alzheimer's hitting as early. Alzheimer's and dementia in general is quite a tricky topic. One of the common phrases that I, I hear a lot when I'm speaking to neurologists and to different doctors is actually that we all will get dementia. Some of us are just lucky enough to die before, uh, which sounds a bit morbid, but I think it's very true. You know, you can, you can uh, buy some flowers or a plant for the house, and if you give it exactly the right amount of water and sunlight at the right amount of time, that plant will have a good life. Mm. But eventually the plant will still die. And it will, it will start to degenerate and you'll see the, the leaves starting to, to wither away. And that's very much how the human body works and how the brain works especially, is we can keep a healthy mind, we can keep a healthy brain, way we keep a healthy body, physiotherapy. And the question that I'm trying to answer at the moment is, is there a way that we can use music to keep the mind healthy um, to prevent um, the onset of Alzheimer's. And have you figured out any par parameters that we can use to, to trigger that? Yes, so the, um, again, coming back to memory, um, uh, we're looking at the moment very much into one specific part of the brain, and that is the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is uh, responsible for long-term memory, short-term memory, and uh, multiple other things, such as directional memory. And what we're trying to do at the moment is stimulate something called neurogenesis. Neurogenesis is the creation of new brain cells. And we believe that if we can stimulate uh, neurogenesis within the hippocampus, uh, which is one of the earlier places that is, uh, that is affected by Alzheimer's, if we can prevent that, then we can prevent some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's uh, kicking in. And can you tell us a little bit about how, how you do that and what kind of music you play for these people? Is it just music that they've heard before? Or is it also a new kind of music? Completely not. Okay. Um, so we're very much looking at specific frequencies, uh, specific pitches and combinations of instruments, combinations. But, but it is of but it is still music. It's not just it's not no, just it's, pitches. It's, it's, it's not very just sound much waves. music. It yeah. is still music. Yeah, right? and um, it, it can range anywhere from jazz to blues to classical to reggae to rock. Uh, to metal, but it's it's very different per person mm -hmm. in terms of genre and style and taste. And I'm guessing the person has to like the kind of music, or does that uh, not matter so much? In some cases, yes, uh, but we're also experimenting the other side of it because you can have quite an, a conscious uh, reaction to music that you don't like, mm -hmm. uh, and we're we're questioning also what what can that stimuli mm. uh, mean for the brain. So yeah, we're looking at multiple genres, um, but we're looking at things within that, you know, and when, when you boil it down, every piece of music is still made by the same amount of notes in Western music. Everything boils down to, to those black keys and to those white keys. Um, and we're looking specifically at those combinations, um, how notes are put together, um, the timing in which they're put together, the instruments and the timbres of the instruments that are playing those notes. That's what we're, we're researching at the moment. Um, we're explicitly, explicitly not looking at the familiarity factor because we're trying not to uh, distort our research with this By idea personal of... personal experience. Exactly. So in, in our research at the moment, we're specifically looking at music that they haven't heard before. Gotcha. And right. so could you give us an example of what, it, like, what are some different... Uh melodies that you might play for them? Uh, that's difficult to say again, um, because it's, it's very dependent on where the patient is. Um, so there's, there's multiple steps in dementia, the seven steps of Alzheimer's. Um, and we're re really focusing on uh, step one to three. Mm -hmm. uh, so step one is um, what you would consider when your mother or your grandmother is starting to get a bit old, or grandfather, I should say. You, you notice that they're losing their keys a little bit more frequently and uh, that sort of thing. That's the very first step that we're, we're focusing on. And we're going up to the point of, for example, um, people are getting ready for work despite the fact that they've been retired for five years. Mm -hmm. It's a very sad case, but they're still able to run their daily life. They're still able to drive a car. They're still able to go to the supermarket and come back. But there's a lot more confusion. Um, and that's what we're trying to clarify.
last time we talked, we also talked about a different subject, which I thought was really interesting. And mm -hmm. feel free, you don't have to answer, obviously. Sure. Um, but uh, we talked about uh, helping against road rage and uh, fatigue while, while driving your car. Is that something you could talk about maybe a little bit? Um, to a certain extent, yes. Okay. Um, because why can't you talk about it? Maybe you could elaborate on that real quick. Right. So we're, um, we're actually in a project at the moment um, to see if we can implement our research and our technologies into vehicles uh, to reduce road rage um, and to reduce tiredness behind the wheel. One of the things that, um, that really upsets me personally is the, the sheer amount of unnecessary deaths uh, that happen on the road um, because of negligence. Um, and that's because of someone driving when they shouldn't be, uh, when they're too tired, driving irrationally and driving angrily. Uh, and this is something that we feel we can challenge with music uh, and the correct implementation of music. And it, it comes very much back to, uh, to the things we've been talking about so far. So how can we use specific melodies to keep someone awake? Or how can we use specific melodies to calm someone down to, uh, to the right point? based on whether it's a tiredness issue or a rage issue. But yeah, it's a little bit tricky for me to talk about at the moment because we're very much in uh, in the productization phase of that research. But maybe you could tell us a little bit about how, in how we can use specific chords or certain grooves or certain melodies or certain structures even to convey a certain feeling in our listeners. And do you have any specific examples or specific um, things that songwriters can do to get a certain reaction out of a listener? Uh, if you look to your traditional music theory, there's a reason that we interpret a minor scale as being sad. And there's a reason that we look at a major scale as being happy. I think finding originality within that is, is, is a very important thing. But it's there for a reason. Now, the, the, the more complex you go with your music theory, be it uh, into modal theory, for example, then you get more complex emotions and more complex tones. What I would also say is music in general, if you speak to someone about music, if you ask them about a song, it's very difficult for them to say, this is a happy song explicitly, unless it's a song called Happy by Pharrell yeah. Williams. <laughs> because music isn't, isn't so one-channeled. It's not, this is a happy song, this is a sad song, this is an exciting song. But it's, it's more of a journey throughout the song. And my advice would be focus more on the journey that you're trying to um, that you're trying to create uh, and the story rather than one binding overall emotion. So if you look at the at the peaks in the in the hype, for example, this uh, is uh, from the addiction formula. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So in the in the first peak, um, maybe that's the happy part of the story. If you if you link it to um, a three act movie, for example, right. the 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 first peak would be happy, the second peak would be conflict, and the third peak would be resolution, and that's how you create a narrative um, within film or with music. Is you have to tell the constant story, and it doesn't have to be as explicit as um, I'm uplifted, so I'm going to do a West lifestyle key change. But there are more subtle ways of doing that. And that, that comes down to your artistic decision and your individuality to say, how explicit do I want to make these transitions between happy to excited to sad or between uh, happy to challenge to resolution? Yeah, if, if there was an answer, music would just be a science. It wouldn't be an art. And I think that's the, uh, that's the nice thing about it is there's no one answer um, for writing. And you mentioned originality again here, and I wonder if, um, can we wear down from hearing the same trick being done too many times? Does if, for example, if we hear a certain uh, chord progression or a certain um, interval leap in a melody too many times, do you think we can grow tired of that and the effect of that that melody otherwise would have, of an emotional effect, um, can sort of wear off and we don't have that anymore? Well... <laughs> I, again, I come back to the same example of Pachelbel's Canon, and I'd, I'd quite simply say no, I don't think we can uh, completely become tired of the same tricks. If it was the case, then that chord progression wouldn't be used anymore. Mm. But we see it still being used quite a lot. So I would say no. 
but it's about being selective um, about which one fits your your piece the best or fits you as an artist the best. Um, you know, we're not we're not going to hear Ed Sheeran uh, on an acoustic track do a backwards su- swoop or a reverse cymbal or those sort of tricks. So it's it's about being selective and finding the right combination of elements um, to to make you sound like you and to sound original. All right. So as you know, I wrote this book, The Addiction Formula, and um, in that it uh, sort of talks about how we experience music. And I've, this is just from talking to a lot of people, listening to the charts, and how they set up certain uh, energy peaks. And I found that the, very much the same thing goes for, as you said, you know, the three act structure in movies. It also goes for public speaking. It goes for a magic trick. All of them are sort of built around the same three act kind of structure. And we see the very same thing happening in marketing at the moment as well, that we get sort of that three act structure going and in a lot of other ex, uh, areas as well like board right. games as you know I'm a big board game enthusiast so um we we get story there as well story is really the biggest thing i feel like of this uh, generation that story is kind of being incorporated into anything here in germany i don't know if that's an international thing we have these christmas calendars where for every day like uh, leading up to christmas i think it starts at december 1st you open up like a little door and right. get, usually usually you used to get a piece of chocolate right yeah we have the same in england yeah. okay perfect and um so now what i've seen is that they have these story calendars so every day you open up one of these doors and you get a bit of a story oh wow And so it's, I think story is really kind of like, it feels to me like that should be almost like a key to the brain, sort of unlocking a part of the brain that lets in emotion or something like that. It feels like it's unlocking a lot in the brain for right. some reason. I think that's that's quite an interesting point, actually. Um, the thing that really drawn me to your book as well is, actually it comes down just to one word, um, which is addiction. Um, I, I find it a very interesting choice that you... You, uh, you use the word addiction, the addiction formula. So actually music um, is processed in the brain as a, um, in a very similar way to chocolate uh, or sex, for example. Uh, it's a satisfying thing and it can actually release um, you know, serotonin or it can release uh, dopamine to make us feel happier or feel more relaxed. And it's been proven in research, actually, from uh, Daniel J. Levitin, the author of um, "This Is Your this Brain, is your brain music. on Music," indeed. <laughs> we won't cut that out. We should leave that in. We should probably <laughs> leave that in. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of uh, one of the things that he mentions in his book is that it's actually been proven uh, that music is addictive. Uh, it's chemically addictive in a similar way that cocaine is addictive. When you hear music that satisfies your brain, that rewards your brain. Uh, for something it's craving, it wants more. Mm -hmm. And actually, we become addicted to music. We become addicted to a certain sound. And that's how our preferences are built up. And I think that's a very, very important thing to remember as well. Also looking at your book, what can we do to feed the craving? What can we do to to give that, that taste that we're looking for within our music? In the book, I talk a lot about these energy peaks and how we lead into those energy peaks specifically. And I sort of compare it to books like, for example, Harry Potter, where uh, the idea is that the verses or basically all the stuff, you know, the daily life of Harry Potter, the daily life of Harry Potter, for mm-hmm. example, is just kind of building up to those big moments. Like, right, we want to see the the first kiss or we want to see the fight against, you know, Voldemort or whatever. You know, right. it's, it's one of those big moments. That's the kind of moments that we read the book for. But all the bits in between are kind of there to like pump, get us pumped for when those big moments happen. And I mean, they're important to establish the character and stuff like that. As as is with music, it's important to establish your sounds before mm-hmm. you give them the big payoff, which is usually the chorus. And this is kind of what everyone listens to a song for is the chorus. So that's kind of where I got this addiction part from is in this anticipation versus gratification in, in the chorus. And mm-hmm. I think something very similar happens uh, in, for example, in drugs or, um, you know, even in binge watching some, you know, series on Netflix or eating Twinkies or something like that, you mm-hmm. know, we just, the, the moment between our payoffs, so between eating a Twinkie and uh, the waiting for the next Twinkie that you can eat, that's kind of where the, the tension is built for that moment. And right. so it's, for me, it's all about that, you, you might call it tension and release, if you will, but I don't think of the chorus of a song necessarily as a release. But um, that's kind of icy, and I wonder if there's anything in uh, science to back 
that up. Well, it's, uh, yeah, very much. It, it, it links back to what we were just speaking about as well, about this idea of a craving. If, you, uh, if you're a smoker, for example, if you don't have a cigarette in the morning with your cup of coffee, which is when you expect it, uh, you're constantly thinking about, okay, well, I want that first cigarette. If you, um, if you are used to listening to music with, for example, an eight bar verse or a 16 bar verse, and then you all of a sudden make it 32 and you exp expand it, or if you just add an extra bar um, mm. in a, in a pre-chorus, it can build up that anticipation. It can make the listener want it just that little bit more. And then the question is, does that improve the sound of the chorus because of that anticipation? I would say absolutely it does. Because um, one of the biggest reasons I wrote the addiction formula is actually that a lot of people that send me songs to give feedback to uh, have really good ideas. You know, there's a lot of times I hear a very good chorus. You know, it's a good melody. So I can, like that totally works. Mm -hmm. And the biggest problem I always feel is just how it's how they build up to it. Right. And so the verses are maybe just too similar to the chorus or they're not building the atten the anticipation enough, right. something like that. So I always feel like placement, the way you introduce th something is way more important than what you actually do. And I think we, we come a little bit full circle here as well when we're talking about the story. We are addicted to the story. I think it's safe to say. And that's why we, why we watch movies is because it's the, the story that's being told. And we want that payoff at the end. We want to, you know, see them driving off into the sunset. And I think music is it's, it's the same thing. A story can't be told uh, in an abstract way. Uh, unless you're Tarantino, it's very difficult to do. But if you put the right structure into it and you build in the right elements of anticipation, then you create a narrative. You create a story that people can process, that people can be addicted to. So I think the structuring of it and the timing is such an important part, equally as important, if not more important, as a catchy melody or the right chord progression. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, because um, I've read a lot on um, screenwriting in preparation for writing the addiction formula as well, and I'm really interested in just writing fiction as well. Right. Um, and one thing that pops up over and over again in these kinds of books and uh, in these kind of lectures is the idea of um, is the idea of plot versus story. Right. And um, the idea of plot is essentially, if you look at a song, would be your structure, mm -hmm. whereas plot uh, the story would be how do the different changes happen within the story? So you could have a really interesting plot. There's a bunch of movies that have a really interesting idea behind them. You're like, oh yeah, if I just read that in a five word summary on Wikipedia or something like that, that would make me really want to watch that movie. But if you see it, you're like, this is boring. Like the individual moments of this aren't really interesting. You know, there's two things to it always. There's always the storytelling bit uh, and there's the plot. There's the overarching kind of thing that's happening in the story. And especially in TV series, we get a lot of lot more storytelling because they have to stretch the story so long, the plot so long, right. that they have to have those little story moments where just these smaller things happen, right? Like, you know, this guy gets, this girl gets pregnant and then it's this guy's fault and he's all of a sudden he's gay and then he gets cancer or whatever. Like, that's the typical kind of, right. you know, thing that we expect from uh, from these like cheap uh, TV series, I right. guess. And uh, so I think it's a it's a tug of war between those two elements as well. I think um, it's not just about like how you structure your song, but it's also how um, yeah you drive through the song. And I very specifically in the addiction formula I use those terms. Uh, I I compare it to driving a car. It's like um, you know I, if you look at it in terms of these energy levels, and if you look at it like a curve, it feels like if you're driving your car up that that hill, right? It feels like there's a lot of tension. You like really have to push the gas very hard to get up there. And then once you're up there, you go much faster and it's really this really satisfying feel, you know? And I think that's, that's an important point as well because no one wants to drive or, or cycle even worse up a really <laughs> steep hill. But the, the reason people do it is because they know they get to go back down the other side. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's the effort versus the, versus the reward. And I think the payoff, the reward is something that um, is is very important, and that's the building up to those peaks and getting the the satisfaction of the big sound of the chorus of the this massive crescendo. We need that payoff in the music. 
So what do you think of music like Look What You Made Me Do that has like these very minimal choruses, which is kind of a thing that um, we've seen Max Martin and his team do lately. Right. Um, where they have like, they have a lot of build up doing the verses and then the chorus is just kind of super minimal. They kind of did it as well a couple of years ago uh, with uh, Katy Perry's um, Dark Horse. Right. Where, where the chorus was kind of like the, I guess it was the, the, the it sounded like a pre-chorus almost. Right. And then the, the post-chorus felt like... Um, felt like the actual chorus and it was just like this 808 kicking really hard and it was really actually very low energy though right it felt very energetic uh, not not very energetic but very it had a lot of tension still to it you know but it didn't give you really that payoff moment that you're talking about right so it was well, really playing with the expectation I, I think uh, I think there's a difference between payoff and energy so what I would say is traditionally what we're used to is um, to use the metaphor of a roller coaster, the verse is clicking up to the top and the chorus is, is the loops. Exactly. But what we're seeing in, in these examples is going for a run. If you go for a run, you're running and running and running to get to the end of your goal, to get to the end of the race. And the reward is the, the rest bite, so the calmness. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is energy the reward? Uh, energy a form of reward. Very good. So, and the other one would probably close close relate to what I call implied tension in the book, where you leave out elements of the music and make that noticeable to the listener. Right. Where you're kind of not giving them what they want to have, and where it's what you might call it the run. You know, where it's like you're making them work for it. Exactly. And we briefly, this is interesting, actually, we briefly talked about um, the Drake episode I did in the artist series. Correct, yeah. And um, I talked about um, how Drake leaves out certain frequencies in his vocals or in his backing tracks. And uh, we briefly talked about that. Would you like to... Yeah, so this, this is something that I like to call the, the phantom notes. It's very similar to if, if an amputee um, loses their arm, for example. They still feel that um, they have an itch in their hand. I call it the phantom notes because of that, because sometimes you can remove the bass drum from a, from a song, from a, from a part, but you still hear it or you still quote unquote feel it. Yeah. Those phantom notes are quite interesting because how much can we imply without playing and make sure that the, the listener can feel it without hearing it? And those are very vague terms, feel and uh, imply. They're very vague. There's not a way to explicitly say this will always make sure that they feel this. It's going to be different for everyone else. Mm. Um, it's also based on what you're used to in music. Absolutely. So, for example, I think a good example of this might be uh, side chaining. So that basically right. is this effect where the where the bass drum kind of triggers a compressor on another instrument. Yes. So that's kind of what you hear on like a, a pad in the background. That, so the bass drum triggers it on the maybe on the floor on the floor, and so the the pad will go what 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 what. Right. So it always closes that sort of gate, or you know, hits the compressor really hard when the bass drum hits. And um, for example, if I'm thinking of Beauty and the Beat by um, Justin Bieber and uh, Nicki Minaj, I believe. Yeah. The, the pre-chorus of that song has a, has a, is actually a section that has side-chained pads, but there's no bass drum there. Right. And so if you're used to, if you've heard that before, and I think most of uh, their listeners will have heard that before, of that sound of the bass drum ducking out the pad, then I think this is going to be a very weird experience for you because you you notice that something is missing there and that's that implied tension that i was talking about and right that, that i think most people will probably hopefully i think i like to think that the things i do as a songwriter matter um hopefully will, people will register that and uh, notice that something is missing there yeah i think um it's two very similar techniques for two very opposing results do you want to notice the absence or do you want them to to ignore the absence i think that's a that's an interesting uh an interesting discussion that mm -hmm. maybe we should have a another time that we can speak four or five hours for <laughs> is um what is the difference between what we write and what we publish and produce and what we actually want people to hear i think there's there's always a, an interesting balance to be found there anything else you wanted to talk about is there uh Anything we haven't mentioned yet? No, I think we've uh, I think we've covered it uh, covered it pretty well. All right, I um, think so too. 
I'm uh, very thankful to be on your uh, on your podcast today. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm very, very encouraged um, to see where you go with your channel. Big congratulations on your 100,000 subscribers. <laughs> massive, uh, massive congratulations there. But no, I'm very interested to, to watch more of your videos, to read more of your books when they finally get here. And uh, just keep staying active with the with the courses and the and the challenges that you're bringing out. Uh, I'll definitely be recommending them. Cool, awesome. Thanks so much, man. And I Thanks. don't think this will be the last time that we talk to each other. I, I surely hope not. I hope this will be the first in a series of podcasts because I think it was very interesting to talk to you, and you have a very unique insight on on things that I think is really interesting. And I think a lot of people are gonna really dig what you brought to the table here. Thank you, and, and likewise. Uh, thanks, thanks. And um, so with that. I would say let's close out this podcast. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And um, I'll see you around on YouTube. Cheers.